been speaking, of course, in this commission about the effect on the Fraser River soft diet, but I believe that the studies you've done and the reports that we've been discussing today uh, indicate that you found this signature in a variety of salmon stocks, not only a sockeye. Is that correct? That is correct. We have observed it in, in Chinook and much less powerfully so in Coho. In any of the other species, or have you looked? We haven't looked, but we, have, we now have some sample collections of pink and chum, so we will be looking at them. And what about the distribution? Uh, where were these fish from that you uh, found the signature? Most of our work has been about the Fraser River, but um, some of our, our, our Coho and, and Chinook um, have extended to east coast of Vancouver Island um, and Burrard Inlet stocks. Um, we have, in, in our Chinook salmon work, extended as far as the Columbia River system, and we do see this signature in the Columbia, in Chinook. I have a note here, and uh, perhaps you can just confirm whether this is correct or not, but have you also um, found the signature in uh, some of the rivers to the north? I'm thinking the skein of the Nass, Stikine. We have not, I believe, we might have looked at a fish or two, but we, we really haven't got, we haven't looked at a lot of samples to the north. We, we have some. Um, uh, Dr. Trudell conducts high seas surveys um, every year, uh, multiple times a year that go up to southeast Alaska. So we do collect, and we run stock ID, so we know where the fish from those collections come from. And so we do have some fish that are from more northerly stocks, and we will be running them, but we haven't really done a lot of work on them yet. So are you able to say whether you found the signature on any of these northern stocks, or that work is yet to be done? I am not able to say that right now. And uh, I think earlier in the day we heard reference to uh, Haida Gwaii, uh, of course a juris jurisdiction that's also uh, an area that uh, people often refer to in terms of where the stocks migrate past. Have you received uh, information in terms of the signature in, in the Haida Gwaii area? In returning adult salmon, um, we do see the signature um, in fish in the Haida Gwaii, yes. And uh, what about the Strait of Juan de Fuca? Yes, we see the signature there as well. Now, uh, of course, everyone's been very curious about your work, um, and uh, in, in that includes my client, the BC Salmon Farmers Association. And is it uh, true to, um, to characterize the, the um, discussions you've had with uh, the BC Salmon Farmers generally, and maybe more specifically with the Mary Ellen Walling, the executive director of the Salmon Farmers Association, that uh, you've indicated to the association that the data you have to date doesn't point to a strong involvement of salmon net pens in the transmission of the virus to migrating salmon? We have no direct data um, on, on aquaculture fish. However, um, the finding that fish are leaving the river with the highest prevalences of this um, would, would stand to suggest that a lot of the transmission of, of, of this virus and I'm talking the virus right now, but one could say the signature as well because the highest prevalence of the signature is also in freshwater, um, um, seems to emanate out of the freshwater environment. That, that, that doesn't mean that, that there couldn't be transfer in a marine environment, but it does mean that we don't have data pointing to that. And uh, also in your discussions with the, uh, the, the, the people at the uh, BC Center for Aquatic Health Sciences, sometimes referred to by its acronym, uh, mm -hmm. CAUSE, You've also had discussions uh, noting that the signature present in the uh, returning uh, adult salmon migrating through Haida Gwaii, uh, the signature shown up uh, before they would have encountered the salmon farms closer down, uh, further south? That is correct. Now, there was a reference just um, a few moments ago about the Harrison uh, stock, and I think I understand that in the uh, samples you've done of the Harrison stock, You've not found the uh, the signature in that. Uh, We've stock. looked at 156 samples now. I only talked about one, th what we looked at last year in kidney tissue, um, but we've also looked at liver tissue and brain tissue, and we've looked at 156 different fish, and we haven't found a single positive smolt from the Harrison. Now the Harrison uh, sockeye have some of the shortest residence time in freshwater in the uh, Fraser system. Yes, they do. And is it true to say that in terms of the uh, relative uh, prevalence rates, your studies have shown the highest, amongst the highest uh, prevalence rates in those uh, sockeye salmon from the upper reaches of the Fraser, in other words, those with the longest residence time in the, in the freshwater in, environment? In, in 2010, certainly that did, did appear to be the trend, that, that the higher prevalence was in, was, was in stocks that were further up the river. And so are you able to draw any conclusions, or have you uh, drawn any conclusions in terms of the relationship to the relative prevalence and the residence time in the freshwater systems? Well, and the unfortunate thing is, and maybe this will be easier in, in Chinook, where we have more stocks within the Fraser River that have those alternate life histories. I mean, 
Harrison fish are the only Fraser River stock with a life history that puts them in the river for less than a year. And, and so, but Chinook salmon, they, you know, we have ocean type and stream type Chinook salmon stocks, and we are interested in that question, whether or not um, that relates to the difference in the life history strategy or something unique about Harrison. I should say that we did find positives in, in, in the um, uh, Birkenhead system, which the Birkenhead fish actually swim by Harrison, the Harrison Lake, in order to get to Birkenhead, and we do see positives in Birkenhead. And was that an anomaly at present? You're not able to explain? There's just not sufficient data? We need, we need more data to try to understand it. Um, but but I, I think, you know, we're doing a study right now which is, which is contrasting um, Harrison and Chilco in sockeye and, um, and, and a, a variety of, of Chinook salmon stream type and ocean type stocks. And we're not only looking for this signature, we're looking for other physiological factors that may differentiate them because just like in Harrison and, and the, the, the other stocks in the Fraser River, in, in the uh, Chinook salmon, the stocks that are in the worst decline tend to be those that, that have a life history more like the bulk of the, of the, um, of the sockeye salmon. So the fish that spend less time in fresh water tend to be doing better than those that spend more. Now you um, made reference to the phrase life cycle, um, and you also referred earlier today to the recent communication, and I believe also uh, communication with the salmon farmers that was not so recent. Uh, you've been endeavoring to uh, coordinate the sampling uh, with the assistance of the salmon farmers, and you now understand that fish will be coming from the various companies that make up the BC Salmon Farmers Association? Yes, that's, that's absolutely correct. And uh, I think it was Dr. Garver who spoke about the protocols necessary for doing uh, work. Uh, it's your intention and your understanding that the BC salmon farmers will cooperate and provide a whole series of life cycle stages of fish from a variety of different farms across the spectrum of the uh, industrial uh, salmon farms. Is that your understanding? I see you're looking to Dr. Garver. Oh, I thought you were asking him. No, I, I don't think he you. knows because he hasn't, wasn't involved in the initial discussion. Uh, so right. I was looking at him wondering if he was going to answer that. Um, well, he might no, be. He could try. No, that, that is my understanding. Again, you know, I, I've really only um, emailed back and forth with, with Mary Ellen Walling. I haven't spoken with the different vets, but I am told that, that they are on board with providing those samples, yes. So within the life cycle and also from multiple farms. And I, I did make a mistake. I called them the, the samples from the river, and I meant from the hatcheries, from freshwater and in the marine environment yes. previously. I wonder if we could just, uh, Mr. Lund, pull up Exhibit 1521 and uh, go to page 13, please. This document, uh, before he flashes past the front page, if you've told us when this was written, um, that you know that I don't have a note of it. Do you recall? Uh, this was provided to the Pacific Salmon Commission in June of 2010. And on, at the bottom of page 13, please. Mr. Hopefully, I don't have a date problem here again. But um, yes, the last sentence. Um, you've written, given the high prevalence before fish leave the river, salmon aquaculture is not likely main route of transmission to wild salmon. We've covered that point already. I just wanted to, um, firstly, these are your words. This is your report, correct? Yes. No, nods don't always transcribe quite as well. Sorry. Yes, so it is. Quite all right. Uh, lawyers are usually guilty of that. Uh, so this is this was your opinion back in June of 2010. Yes. And uh, it really accords with your your current view as well, as a result of the recent discussions you've had with the salmon farmers. You've you've repeated this. Uh, you've not changed your point of view in this regard, have you? Not particularly. I, it, it doesn't dismiss the potential of transfer back and forth between wild and, and aquaculture fish um, when they're passing salmon farms. But again, I would say that the main time point of transmission appears to be occurring in freshwater. And, and the last comment about not um, removing that possibility, you, you say that, but it's purely speculative because to date Absolutely. We have no information about Atlantic salmon aquaculture fish. Even whether they possess the Even signature. whether they possess the, the signature or the virus. That is what we're hoping to gain by working with the industry. Thank you. Um, Mr. Commissioner, did you want to take a, a short break now? Thank you. We will now recess for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner.
Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Garver, these questions are for you and they relate to uh, IHN. Uh, my question uh, in a general sense is, uh, there any evidence that the uh, prevalence of IHN stocks in BC sockeye salmon have changed since the 1990s? So a, a predecessor of mine, Garth Traxler, began a uh, surveillance program for IHNV in various uh, sockeye salmon stocks. And so we have, it's actually one of the few diseases or pathogens that we have a very long-term monitoring program for. And he started this back in 1986. And what we found is that the prevalence values vary considerably from year to year and between stocks. And since that monitoring period, there were a few uh, outbreaks in the salmon farms. And when we compare those times during the outbreaks to the stocks that we are looking at for IHN prevalence, it didn't appear to change the prevalence in the wild stocks. In other words, it wasn't a driving factor for the occurrence of IHNV in the wild stocks. And uh, in that work, uh, sir, did you find whether there was any correlation in the uh, IHNV prevalence as between adults and uh, its occurrence in fry? No, and that was, that was the big motivation behind beginning uh, the monitoring program is, is to establish something where we could predict uh, the occurrence of IHN disease in our wild stocks. And so Garth Traxler had looked at the adult, the prevalence in adults, and then the subsequent year, the fry from those adults looked at the prevalence in there. And when we run the correlations, there is no correlation between the prevalence in adults and those that occur in its offspring the following year. And I think um, a, a another part of your work and your summary could be summarized as this, uh, that is that your work suggests, ha has suggested that IHNV is not a major contributor to the long-term decline of these two stocks, and by the two I'm referring to the Weaver Creek and the Dean River? That's correct. There, there has been episodic events which have caused catastrophic mortality, particularly in the Weaver Creek. Uh, Garth Traxler documented this in, I believe it was 1987, publication that the outbreak occurred in 1986, and it killed that Weaver Creek, it killed about 50% of the fry. So there was a dramatic impact at that, but it was episodic in that it, it's, it wasn't reoccurring every year. And so from what we, what we have to date is data to suggest that, yeah, if we're looking at a long-term trend where IHN or reduced productivity in the Fraser stocks, it's the sole factor wouldn't be IHN. So noting the outbreaks that you've just done, it, it is correct to characterize that IHNV uh, was not a major contribute to the long-term decline of the stocks, but you had spikes when it went through those two systems? There are spikes, that's correct. And the problem is it's very difficult with, with diseases. There could be compounding factors. So if you have other diseases or other environmental factors that increase the susceptibility to that disease, a lot of those we don't have determined, and IHN would fall into one of those categories. We don't know all the predisposing factors to disease. Thank you, uh, Dr. Garver. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner.